Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Now, I'm very interested in this interview. Uh, first actually came across this gentleman on Jeff Buys Cars websites. And then since then, I've seen him all over the place, uh, which is fantastic. And he is the author of this very remarkable and very chunky uh, book. So don't use it as a table thing because your table will be like that. It's so packed with information. The falsification of history. Now, on this channel, we've been realising that the world is upside down and we've been lied to so much. But how much? Well, a, a quick glance at the contents here and you basically think, hang on a second, throw everything in the bin because it seems that pretty much everything is a lie. My guest is the inimitable John Hamer. He is a writer, researcher, public speaker, and he joins me now from Bath. Not in the Bath, though, uh, John. Hello, welcome to the show. Thanks, Richard. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me on your show. I have been ploughing through, through the book. When I saw Jeff Buys Cars videos and I thought, this is a book I've got to read, which was only a, a couple of weeks ago or so, maybe three weeks ago, bought the book and I, I'm only a tiny way through. Uh, but already I am, as I said in the inter at the beginning there, you just go, no, not that as well, not that. I mean, some things, you know, we know about um, and, and a lot of people, of course, on the page watching this stuff like the 9-11 were going, oh, yeah, you know, we knew all that. JFK, Diana. Oh, good. There's an interesting angle on that. Um, but even sort of things like Hitler and Nuremberg, uh, you've got in there where it's like, oh, it's not quite what you think. And this is absolutely fascinating. So, um, John, first of all, I know this is your first book and you've written subsequent books. And this was written something like 12 years ago, did you yeah, say? Yeah, it was published in early 2012. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I started writing it in 2009. It took me a long time because it was the first one. I'd never done anything like that before. So, yeah, the other ones, you know, followed a little bit more quickly. But, yeah, that was uh, that was the first one, 2012. And and it's what's interesting is it published before the COVID pandemic, plandemic, whatever you want to call it, yes. uh, of which would have been a massive great chapter. <laughs> it would, and it is in my sub in, in a couple of my subsequent books. I wrote a whole book, exact well, actually slightly larger than that, if you can believe it, uh, with a, a my co-author Shannon Rowan in the states. And we together wrote something called Welcome to the Masquerade, which absolutely lays bare everything about, you know, the, those terrible years, 20, 2020 to 2022. Um, yeah, but I also covered it slightly in my sister, my companion book to that one, which is called The Falsification of Science. And, 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 and science... So and science is, sorry, I'm just pausing there because every now and again I get a little bit of strange feedback which we can't really uh, do anything about, just to apologise to the audience there. Um, science is, as you and you say that in the beginning of this, you, you talk about how science has become the new religion um, and, and actually we've gone away from things which sound like they shouldn't have any basis, like myths and folklore and all of that. But actually now I think we're all beginning to realise, and you so eloquently put it in your book, which, by the way, is so easy to read, and I love that because it does seem to be written for, you know, an idiot like myself to understand it, um, that so much of science, including the whole Darwinism business and all of these things, has been there to fool us. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry, go on. Sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say... Everything in there is there to fool us. And we, as complete dupes, seem to have swallowed it hook, line and sinker. How has that happened, John? Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, the reason why they do it, Richard, I mean, it might sound like an obvious answer, but the, the reason why they do it, first of all, is because the only way that a few thousand people, and this is all we're talking about, can control eight billion of us, allegedly, and uh, that's a, that's up for question, by the way, but that's another yes. story. Um, the only way that they can control us is by creating a false reality. OK, by creating this re reality whereby their agenda is first and foremost and their agenda is to control us. So 
you know that that this is the, the only way they can do it um but the the tools that they use for that and and you know to actually keep us in this little box of reality that they've created for us is by using uh, subtle psychological techniques now these people are masters of the human psyche they know exactly which buttons to push which which levers to pull within the human psyche and uh, they use them all you know they have at their fingertips vast resources as, as i'm sure everyone out there is aware and they use those resources in their quest their never-ending quest to subdue us and subjugate us so yeah i mean it's it's not rocket science but it's very effective yes yeah. and i suppose the biggest uh, thing is that whole business if you tell a lie enough times yes. and if you tell a big lie enough times yes. no matter how stupid it sounds yes. people will actually believe it yeah that's true and and i think the reason for that is because um we you know i think people are essentially good okay okay there's some bad apples among us but i think people by and large are essentially good and we we would we find it very difficult to believe that someone could lie on that to that extent because we would never do that we might tell little white lies or even big white lies occasionally to friends and family for our own little purposes but we would never think of creating a huge huge falsehood um and and so it kind of doesn't compute with us so we can't believe that they were actually lie on that scale but of course mm. we do they have to and yet and yet, of course, when you lie about anything, you've got to remember what it is you've told people, you've and all the all, yes. all those, yeah. And and then you get the likes of the so-called conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. unpicking these these big false flag events yes. and showing you ha the, that they couldn't possibly have happened. Yeah. And yet, the cognitive dissidence that people have will just ignore the evidence. What's going on there, John? Yeah, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? But it, again, it comes down to um, the psychological manipulation that we're subjected to. You know, there's something called propaganda, which I'm sure everybody's aware of, and they use it to its fullest extent. They they hammer us with fake information uh, so hard and so often that we actually do believe it's true because we can't believe that, you know, something that is so all-pervasive in our lives and in society is not actually real and mm -hmm. for example I and mean, i'll just go off topic slightly just to give an example and that is in my book falsification of science i talk about the great dinosaur hoax dinosaurs do not exist they never existed um and you know it's just used as a prop for their fake theory of evolution simple as but you know dinosaurs are so pervasive in society they're in especially to, for children of course you know you get them while, mm -hmm. while they're young that's that's the philosophy that they use and, you know uh, children's books games computer games cartoons films it's all dinosaur based you know even you know you even have dinosaur toys logos on pajamas and t-shirts and all the rest of it and, it, and it's like inuring them with with this idea that these these fake creatures or these fake reptiles actually did exist and you know i prove in my book i believe that uh, they never did but that was just an example and i'm sorry for the digression no but. No, no no i think that's uh, you, you've uh, segued into one of the areas that i wanted to talk about oh, okay. which <laughs> which which is actually consumerism right uh, yeah. because as you say you know dinosaurs are being used and, and sold on so many different things and of course there'd be tv programs that kids yeah. are, are glued to i mean certainly shouldn't be watching tv a, at all um <laughs> <laughs> because that's a you know their program you all of this that we course, we're beginning yeah. to understand but um so yeah i wanted to sort of explore this consumerism because we've all been funneled down this route to buy the latest upgrade to the point that sometimes you have no option anymore. It's like with um, Windows and various computer systems, you yeah. know, you, you go to switch it on and you can't even use the bloody thing because now it's doing an upgrade and you've got that feeling that the new thing is always better. Desirable. The, yeah, they desirable. make it so desirable that, that you can't resist. And, and then, of course, there's peer pressure 
and all that kind of thing. You know, if your neighbor's got a brand new car, you think, you know, it's keeping up with the Joneses kind of idea, you know, the old fashioned idea of keeping up with the Joneses, whereby you don't want to be outdone by your peers. You feel the necessity to compete with them on some financial level. And again, it's all uh, brainwashing, propaganda, making people believe that kind of stuff so that they buy, buy, buy consumer goods. And I mean, the thing that, that comes into me as somebody who is uh, desperate now to get away from the big towns and the, the noise and the, all of the lights and stuff and to go back onto the land and, and just do very simple things is actually those are the, the simple things. We, we, at the weekend, we were down not too far from you in Wiltshire okay. uh, milking cows. Right. And I can tell you, we were with the animals. We brought them into the uh, dairy area. And then we, we were milking them and we were interacting with them. Wow. And it's just so, um, it, 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 what's the word? it was just so joyful. It was just so joyful doing something very simple, t l very low technology. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then I come back here and it's like, oh, yeah, there's all this yeah. electronic trinkets and stuff. That's right, yeah. um, and, and you wonder really why we've been teased away from those very simple things that people love to do walk in nature see the sunrise breathing fresh air walk along the beach you know the things yeah. that actually mean something yeah yeah well i mean there's an old adage isn't there you know bread and circuses which uh, you know comes from roman times where the the emperors and the, and the powers that be in those times knew that the, the only way that they could control their relatively small, you know, smaller populations than we have now. But the only way that they could control us, all those people was by making sure they were well fed, bred, and entertainment circuses. And, and that was a, I can't remember who it was, it was said, said it, but it was some Roman guy that said, you know, bread and circuses. And, and what he meant by that was, you know, just keep people fed and entertained and they'll be happy. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, consumerism, consumerism all obviously goes a lot further than that. It, it, it's, about, it's about the way they make money from us. They pay us, we work for their corporations, they pay us with one hand, and then they take most of that back again through these often useless consumer goods. You know, and that, that's the cycle of life, it seems to be. You know, that's the way things are. Yes, yeah. so, so people are having to go on this treadmill to continually purchase these yeah. items that they never actually wanted they've yeah. been seduced to think they need that they only keep for a short space of time and they lob them away and i think you mentioned things like fashion yeah yeah fashion. Is so transient isn't it you know you buy something you pay a fortune for it to keep up with the trends and then six months later you know there's some new craze and so you go with that one as well and then the, the, all the stuff that you bought that fitted in with the previous way of living is is either given away or thrown away and of course all the time that these materials are being robbed from the earth which yeah, deplete and, which you know is depleting and damaging the planet of course and of course that's never mentioned you know when they talk about you know green the green uh, movement if you like the, the, you know, the corporations never get criticised for, for behaving in this outrageous manner. And it is outrageous. Mm. Um, you know, it's always the people to blame. It's the people, it's the people, it's the people. You know, it's yeah, we're so same, greedy. Yeah, it's the same with, yeah, that's right, Richard Greed. And it's the same with the climate change situation. You know, the, the big corporations don't get blamed for polluting the place. It's the people. You know, yes. we're, we're the problem, you know. And, uh, yeah, so it just, it just subjugates us even further, sadly. And, and and with that, um, you know, you mentioned the sort of green agenda and climate change. We're being shoehorned into this nonsense of having just one source of energy, the electric energy, in which there's so many sort of ironies connected with that, that one car charging up is taking several households of electricity just to charge it up overnight. Or you've got the solar panels on the ground, but part of the the... The, the saving of us is to dim the sky so that the solar panels can't even get the electricity yeah. in the first place. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the biggest irony to me, though, Richard, in that in that particular uh, scenario is the fact that what people fail to comprehend is how is electricity generated? 
Okay, right. that's like solar and and wind power, uh, but but when you when you break it down, solar and wind power come to something like less than two percent of our entire our entire energy needs. Electricity is still and will continue to be for a, you know our, a, the foreseeable future created with fossil fuels, which is what they ironically are trying to uh, you know ban or or get rid of. Um, you know, electricity is created through biomass and through coal still. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's the whole thing is just nonsense when you analyse it, yeah. And is it is it true I heard um, that oil is not a fossil fuel, but they call it a fossil fuel for convenience? Exactly. But it's actually so below... The- it's below the, foss- the, the the lowest fossil that's ever been found, and yet there it is, a great pool of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it is true, I believe. Um, it's not something I've looked into massively, but I have brief, I've, I've read a few articles about it. And they want it to be regarded as a fossil fuel because what pushes up profits? Shortages. Scarcity. Yeah. Shortages. And, you know, if it's a fossil fuel... And they keep taking out and periodically over over my lifetime anyway, they've come to us and said, we're running out of oil. The oil will be gone by 2000. The oil will be gone by 2020. And it's all a way of pushing up prices and make, and increasing their profits. But yeah, back to the, the original point. Um, no, it isn't, it's not a fossil fuel. It's something within the earth. And I don't understand what, because I've not looked into it deeply enough, but it's created naturally, um, it's an ongoing process, but they imply that it was a, a historical process that happened years and years ago, and it's just not replenishable. Well, that's nonsense. It, the Earth is constantly creating oil in some way or another, which I'm not sure about, but apparently that's the case. And, and a lot of a lot of these things, like oil, like the uh, the melting of the ice sheets and things, are all places that you and I and, and members of the audience ordinarily would never actually get to see. And so we have to take the messages that they tell us at face value. And so, for some reason, we do like the moon landings. And, you know, we can't go to the moon to verify all of that. Um, although I have to say in your book, you take you take us through the stages of just simple logic. And then you realize, of course, there's no way that these people could have got up there oh, absolutely it, but again it, it's that powerful tool that they use against us called propaganda uh, yes. you know, that they they hammer us with these fake ideas until we we can't our mind cannot conceive that it's inaccurate because it's just blasted us blasted at us from every angle um you know so and all the corp, all the big corporations buy into this stuff as well because if you follow the pyramids to the top where does it lead it leads to the people who are perpetrating this stuff in the first place so the corporations are all bought into it and the important thing richard is if they don't buy into it they get removed from investment portfolios and this is a very important point because um if they if they're removed from these huge investment portfolios uh, whereby people invest in, you know, their, the stocks and shares of a group of companies. If the if those are corporations get removed from those, then their stocks would go rapidly down the pan. So they have a financial incentive for continuing to perpetuate this insidious agenda that we all live in. Yeah, yeah. and and they do it so well, sadly. Um, let's. So, I mean, you've written several books now. Um, and I can imagine it, t- it takes a long time to uh, put a, a great big wedge like this together on and, and all the different topics. How do you go about verifying what you are talking about, each different subject? Yeah, well, it, uh, I often say when I'm being interviewed that I, I look at reality as like a, a, however many pieces you want to call it, but a, 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 let's say a billion piece jigsaw puzzle, okay? Right. And as you put the pieces in place, the picture becomes clearer. Just as if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, a small jigsaw puzzle on a table, the the, the overall picture becomes clearer, even though there are gaps there. Yes. But the more pieces you put in place, just like a jigsaw puzzle, the easier it is to fit other pieces into into the puzzle itself. And not only that, I have an extensive, extensive collection of books that I use, and I think it's very true to say that the older the book, 
the more likely it is to tell the truth. It's not an absolute cast iron guarantee that it will. But for example, I have one that was written in 1860 about the gunpowder plot, and it tells the absolute truth with no agenda behind it. And this is the point. A lot of the stuff that, that is real and the truth has no agenda behind it, has no, no axe to grind. So the chances of it being accurate are far greater than the stuff that they pump at us because we know that they pump this stuff at us for a reason and that is to uh, uh, you know, deny us the truth of, 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 of the way society is run. In a nutshell. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of a convoluted answer, but I think you know. Hopefully... No, no. Uh, so, I mean, the thing about these books that you're you're writing. Let me. I'm going to flip things on their head, and this might be a, a bit of a challenge. It seems now, and I've become very sceptical about everything. Certainly, recent events and and things that seem very obvious when it's on mainstream media. Not that I actually watch mainstream media now. I've made that decision many years ago. Um, so just not even in engage with it so let me ask you this then what events in history would you say are actually true oh, okay it's a good question i think um i don't want to give people the wrong impression that absolutely the entirety of history is false you know mm. all the events that i talk about did actually happen but just not in the way that they tell us yes. or not for the reasons that they tell us i think that's probably the more important aspect of that um, they do it because they twist it to fit the, the, their agenda, their ongoing agenda, which changes over the years, but is broadly the same thing. Um, so, yeah, you get a situation whereby, for example, World War Two. Everybody knows how World War Two started. Or do they? Mm. Or do they? Nah. No, no, you don't. And not if you believe the mainstream version of how World War Two started. In fact, the whole history of everything is, is you know can be classed in a similar vein really because they want you to believe world war ii was fought for a particular reason whereas you know it wasn't and it's the same with you know that's a, that's a large example but it's the same with all the other minor incidents you know um i mentioned the gunpowder plot a few minutes ago gunpowder plot was not at all as as it's uh, as it's told by the mainstream um, and just pick any anything. I mean, even the more modern stuff, which people can probably more easily relate to, such as the death of Diana, 9-11, 7-7-2 bombings. Um, yeah, we know that they all happened, and certain elements of it's true, but the, the, the ongoing agenda behind it and what actually happened in detail is absolutely not true, and this, and this is the difference. So it's not like the whole of history is fake, just the details, if you like. Right. So, so something like the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, I think, is the date. Oh, 1381, yeah. Um, at, in which people like Watt Tyler, who apparently didn't feature very highly in it at all, yeah. in ter but has been turned into the hero, uh, yeah. along with John Bull, and there's another guy whose name I have forgotten. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, we people are rising up because of tax and you can't help feeling that we're being taxed to the hilt at this very moment so there's yeah. lots of sort of parallels they seem to have um gathered themselves incredibly fast and yet they didn't have twitter or facebook or you know mobile phones they just had close-knit communities and people talking to each other i mean and 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 away they went and started to sort of take uh, back control as it were by uh, burning and raising to the ground a lot of yeah. the rich and the, the church people and, and all that until culminating with the king at smithfield richard the yeah. second as a young man is so i'm assuming those events actually happened is, is there any alteration on on history on that do you know of uh, not that i'm aware of no i mean that that's maybe one of the exceptions to the rule but i uh, I'm, I, I've looked into it, but I've never found anything other than the mainstream version, which may or may not be accurate, you know, so perhaps that's I mean, that. it gets quelled in the end, and, and they don't really get what they ask, you know, the king yeah, pretend, well, pretends to give them things, and well, then he just re right. regales on it. Apparently, apparently Richard II made all sorts of promises, and so they, it satisfied them, and they began to disperse, and then Richard's troops attacked them and killed Wat Tyler, and and his compadres, 
Um, you know, I, I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean, the whole thing could have been made up for all I know, to be honest. But uh, I, I guess that there is some truth to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that's the thing. You are left wondering when you read this sort of stuff and, and on everything now, what is true? Because you can't trust mainstream media. But then at the same time, it's very difficult to know whether alternative media you can trust because there's a lot of falsification going on in that. And there's people like me who are being said by many or a small number that, you know, I'm a shill or I'm controlled opposition. We're all controlled oh, something or other. Yeah, I mean, um, don't take it personally. I mean, I, I get that as well, you know, because if you say something that someone doesn't agree with, it seems to me that they immediately reject the rest of the stuff that you've done. You know, it, it's it's um, it just seems to be a human characteristic these days. I don't know whether it's always been the case. But, yeah, I mean, I get it as well. You know, John Hamer is this, he's that, you know, and, uh, yeah, so therefore don't believe a word he says. And I think that's probably been deliberately engineered to, the, to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't take it personally, and I'm sure you don't either. No, no, no. I, I mean, it, it does make me smile, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does make me smile because yeah. one minute, every, you know, somebody can be with you 100% on a number of things, and it's that just one something that yes. they disagree with, and, and it's flipped everything. Absolutely. Uh, and and this is the weird place that we're in with this pol you know potentially polarizing mm. one another divide and conquer which uh, we know and and yet even within let's say the truth or freedom movement we still are are triggered in the same way and we're not sort of thinking straight because uh, our thinking has been bent so let me uh, um then ask you how do we combat this how do we combat the, the 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 whole brainwashing that's happened to us generally? That when we see things, um, that we kind of go, "Hang on, what's the agenda here?" That may have happened, but how? Why is it twisted that way? And how do I really interpret something? Yeah, it's a difficult. I mean, it's difficult uh, to to answer it, Richard. To be honest, I mean, you, you know, you can only. Um, there's only so much you and I can do to convince people to to do their own research, but I mean that's the key to do their own research, and even that's not not fallible, you know, not infallible, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, because there is so much, as you said, misdirection, misinformation, and disinformation. The subtle difference between being disinformation that is that dis disinformation is deliberate, misinformation is accidental, broadly speaking. But there's so much of that around that it is very difficult to discern the truth from lies. And, and it's getting more difficult. And the reason it's getting more difficult is, is because of something called censorship. You know, I was uh, I was supposed to be speaking in, in Stroud this, this last weekend, and it never happened because the venue cancelled on me because of the content. Uh, you know, they're not the organisers, the venue cancelled it. Yeah. And uh, it's happened to me more than once. You know, so, it, you know, you can't even talk about you know, fairly innocuous things anymore that go against the agenda. Uh, you know, it, it is, and there are certain things that are just absolutely taboo. Because if right, yeah. truth came out about them, then it would destroy the whole house of cards, you know. And it, and it's often those things that people want to question you on or hear an opinion on. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it's weird that it's Stroud, because Stroud is ordinarily quite a, an open... Uh, place for that there's a lot of I know there's a sort of lot of things goes on in Stroud that is uh, more on on the freedom truth um, health sort of thing but like everywhere I suppose it's got its dis, um, its dissenters or uh, well, the dis is, distractors there are a lot of there, there, there is a group one particular group in Stroud who are very you know woke <laughs> I don't like that phrase but woke I think covers it um, mm. who, who just disrupt anything and everything that anyone tries to do that you know that, that is con connected with the truth movement <coughs> so whether they are actually um, you know paid shills or whether the you know, I don't know but that that's just the case and I'm, I'm sure it's the case in other places it happened to me in Hull for example a few years ago uh, I was I was uh, and that this was the organizer, actually, a, a truth movement organizer who actually told me that he wouldn't have me there. She wouldn't have me there as it was 
because I was a Holocaust denier. You know, and I thought, well, this is a truth movement. What chance do we stand here? Well, yeah. And, and, and as you said before, it, people haven't got to agree. It's just this lack of open mindedness and go, OK, so you deny that. Yes. Be quite interesting. You know, to me, yeah. when if, if it's something that sort of go, oh, that's that sounds odd. Yes. Uh, you know, if you said, I, I don't believe that. Uh, and some people don't, you know, say that gravity doesn't exist. You know, when you drop your pen, it doesn't actually fall to the ground. OK, so I would be fascinated to hear that. Yeah, not just too. go, oh, well, I'm. Oh, in that case, it's uh, I'm not having you here. I mean, it's very bizarre. It is absolutely. I know. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I don't believe gravity exists either. But I don't. <laughs> I do believe that when you drop your pen, it falls to the ground. But I don't believe it's gravity that causes it. Right. <laughs> uh, but that's another. I mean, if you want to just briefly. Talk yeah, about yeah. That, d- d- tell uh, me that what, because what, what what we believe to be gravity, and by the way, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton wrote a, a book called. Um, Principia Mathematica in the 17th century, which was about, I can't get the angle right, but to put them there, which is about that thick. And that was wow. just to describe gravity, okay, which is just nonsense. I mean, the, it's very simple, it's a very, very simple explanation. If you, if something, if you drop something and it falls to the ground, it's due to something called relative density, okay? It's denser than air, so it just falls to the ground, okay? If it was lighter than air, it would either float upwards or stay still, uh, depending on the precise amount of relative density between that and the air around it. If Newton's apple, for example, had, uh, I mean, it's not a true story, by the way, it was just a, a, a kind of a, oh, you know, yes, a yes. yeah. If, if Newton's a- apple had not, hit him on the head as if, as if sat under the tree but had fallen into the pond it was it was um sitting beside then it would have floated because an apple is less dense than water right it's a very very simple equation but they cover they have to have gravity t- to make their fake model of the universe work Oh, okay, so so that and leads gravity. us on. The whole thing falls apart without gravity. So they have to have this patch to this ridiculous theory that they have about, oh, not a theory, but this ridiculous uh, fake universe that they, they propound. Without gravity, the whole thing would fall apart. So they have to concoct this ridiculous explanation um, of, of how and why, uh, you know, things fall or float or... You know, I mean, when you think about gravity, um, how come gravity is powerful enough to hold trillions upon trillions of tons of water to the surface of the Earth, mm. and yet it's not powerful enough to stop a butterfly from fluttering into the air, or smoke from rising? Y- yes. Yeah, well, uh, uh, yes. When you put it like that, it, it, you know, it's, it's like uh, it's like a logical thing, isn't it? You yeah, just yeah. go. Uh, Logic defeats the the thing, and I suppose the hev- I suppose you might you might argue well if the water is all very very heavy, it's it's more likely to be pulled in, but then I guess um, if you've got a magnet and you've got an iron filing and a ball bearing, let's say they're both, it's just that the the iron filing might take longer, but it would slowly come down to the magnet. Yes. Presumably. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm, so does that mean, I mean, I didn't want to get into this. So you say no, the, sorry, the, the I, full... I no, 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 that's time. fine. You've done it now. And, and of course, it's piquing people's interest watching this. So um, the fake, the idea of the universe then, is, is, is this leading into the flat Earth? Yeah, well, it, it kind of is. I mean, I'm not 100% convinced about flat Earth, but I, I do know that, and, I, and again, I cover this in the falsification of science, all this stuff. But I do know that there are some very, very valid arguments for the flat Earth, as well as some against it. So, you know, I'm kind of in, in balance, but I, I do believe that there is something, there is something that is not right about this globe versus flat um, you know, uh, paradigm, if you like. There's definitely something because, you know, what, for example, what? you know, you, you can see a lot further than you should be able to if the Earth was a globe. 
because there is a, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, it's a mathematical formula for working out the, the Earth's curvature. Right. And you can actually see things that are hundreds of miles away, and they should be like, you know, thousands and thousands of feet below the horizon if the curvature calculation was correct. And there's no reason to assume it isn't, because that's what they tell us, assuming, mm -hmm. you know, their, their, their globe is correct as it is. So it could be, and again, this is just my possible speculation, it could be that the Earth is much bigger than the tellers, uh, rather than it being, um, and why would they do that? Okay, right, I'm going to have to explain that, aren't I? because I don't just, don't just want to leave that there. Um, for example, in the hanging in, and this is a fact, this is not me making this stuff up, I've got, I've got a copy of the picture. There is a, a picture hanging in the lobby of the United Nations building in New York, which shows the Earth on a flat plane, and Antarctica is an ice wall going all around the edge of the existing continents. And then outside that ice wall of Antarctica, there are hundreds of other continents. Now, is the, the Earth a much bigger place and they're covering it up for some reason, which I, I don't know and can't explain? Or is it a flat plane or is it both? I don't know. But all, I think the point I'm making is that something smells very strange about the whole thing. And you mentioned, I you, that. Yeah, you mentioned in your book, um, I forget how to pronounce the, the chap's name, the, is it Heligan Principle or something like that, in which um, they give you the illusion that there's only two things, it's either this or it's that, and so we're both Hegelian. arguing. Hegelian, yeah, the Hegelian dialectic. The, yes, um, and so, so, and it seems to me with the flat Earth thing, it's it's kind of a bit like, oh, they've got people going, is it flat or is it spherical? Yes. But it could be something totally different. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and and nobody's nobody's looking at possibly the true answer yeah. because they've divided us over saying, exactly. well, it's one of these, isn't it? It's one of these. Yeah, spot on, Richard. And and I think you know that then that you you see it on the internet. You know the arguments between the flat earthers and the globe earthers. It's just it's just a distraction. The whole thing. Um, but as to which is true, I, don't, I honestly don't really know. Yeah. I do know a, a, a friend of mine, as girlfriend, comes from Africa, and he was talking to her about various things, and she just happened to say it's much bigger than it's drawn on the maps. What is that? Uh, yeah, and, and now I don't quite quite where she gets that, but she just said, you know, she finds it's laughable when you see the maps because she says it's far bigger. Now I can't verify any of that, um, but it if if going down that route of the Earth is bigger than we're told, then that may make more sense. Yeah. Um, but you know, anyway, anyway. So, but that's an interesting thing. The, just that point, and it goes on with so many different things in which we are talking about two poles and both of those could be wrong. Yeah. And well, they've... So, yeah, it's very strange that neither the Arctic, well, especially the Antarctic, there's something called, you know, people out there may have heard of this already, I apologise for uh, explaining, but there's something called the Antarctic Treaty, which was devised in the very late 1950s. And the Antarctic Treaty is the only treaty in the history of the world to have been signed by every single country. Now, what the Antarctic Treaty has done has made it virtually impossible for anyone to go there. And I know someone will say, oh, yeah, but I've been there on a cruise ship. Yes, you have. Yes, you may have. But you'll only have been to either one or of two inlets into the, the ice. There are only two places in the entirety of Antarctica where you can actually dock ships. The rest is, is, is a 200-foot ice wall. Now, and then, even then, if you get to set foot on Antarctica, you can only go a certain distance inland, and the rest of it is is forbidden. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to fly over Antarctica. You're not allowed to sail near it without express permission, and even then only go to these certain locations where cruise ships, tourists go, just so they can say they've been to Antarctica. Uh, planes, planes are threatened with being shot down if they approach too near. And ships are, there are patrol boats, international patrol boats, not just from one nation, but like an international conglomerate of patrol ships that keep other ships away. And if they're, and they, you know, they've got the radar on them, and if they encroach too close, they're turned away at gunpoint. 
Okay, this is not up for speculation. This is, I know yeah. this to be fact. Uh, and the set similar with the Arctic, only not quite so bad for some reason. You're not allowed to overfly the Arctic. You know, so it, 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 as far as I'm aware, there's been no specific treaty about that. But why? What are they protecting? Mm. You know, it's just a, a very, very, it's an oddity. And, uh, and we'll, you know, they'll, they'll never tell us why, of course. It's just a fact. It's just the, that's the way it is, you know. Yes. And if that's, if, I mean, that does make it very, very suspicious for any inquiring mind, okay. um, you know, that you would do that because nowhere else has that no. sort of thing. And you think, well, this that's is bizarre. Right. How, well, I don't know how true it is as well, but I've heard, heard tell of, you know, the fact that they have regular flights to Antarctica or some place within Antarctica where prominent people go, you know, such as ex-presidents and heads of state and that kind of thing. They actually get taken there. Whether that's true or not, I can't vouch for it. But if, if so, it's quite an interesting point. Perhaps they go there to be re-cloned. <laughs> yeah. So the or, next or, or or to be inducted into some kind of secret society that who who knows what the real truth is about the earth I, you know it, it, yeah absolutely um it's it i mean it's all very strange so t tell us uh, that you, you've told us about i mean i told you that you've done that one because you sent i bought it from you so there's the falsification of history the falsification of science but you've written some other interesting yeah. books as well yeah, I wrote, uh, again, again, with my co-author, Shannon, in the States, I wrote um, Welcome to the Masquerade. I'm just looking to see if I've um, got, oh, yeah, here we go. This is, if I click on it, I'm, oh, I haven't shown it. Here we go. If I click on it, that's it there. Welcome to the Masquerade. Yeah, um, that's about the events of 20, well, actually pre-2020, from about 2012 to 2022, talking about what went on in the specific years of 2022 in terms of the huge con that we were subjected to. Um, so, you know, it's a massive, uh, analysing it from all different directions, you know, uh, scientifically and physically and politically and and all the rest of it and all the different connotations of it and the whys and wherefores of it. So that's mm. covering the, you know, the COVID nonsense. Um, that's so that one. Very intriguing cover. I like that, you know, the the, um, the artwork there. Yeah, well, that was actually uh, designed by my co-author, Shannon. Uh, who's a brilliant, ah, brilliant artist, among other things, among, among other talents. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, just just to mention your website, for those that are interested, falsificationofhistory.co.uk. I'll put a link in the description, and wow. we, can see, um, we can see there loads of um, behind the curtain. What's yeah. the... Uh, Behind the curtain, it's going on. Behind the curtain, thing. actually, it, it's um, it's actually uh, it's it's subtitled as a chilling expose of the banking industry. Uh, but I realised after I'd finished writing it that I kind of deviated from that a little bit, uh, well, quite a lot actually. It, it, it's more accurate subtitle would be a chilling expose of the new world order. Ah. It goes into massive detail about the new world order. Uh, but I, and I've tried to get the subtitle changed on Amazon. Uh, they wouldn't allow me because I said if you do that, we regard that as a completely different new book, and you'd lose all the reviews on on behind the curtain. I uh, um, see. It's got lots of five star reviews, so I, I didn't want to lose those. So I've, I've just left it as it is. Um, but it, yeah, it's a two volume book, and and both volumes are larger than the one that you've got on your. Oh desk my goodness, there, Richard! Yeah, gosh. <laughs> So, so yeah, and, it's, a, it's a massive tome, in effect. Uh, but I, do, I, I just want to say again, um, for the sake of the uh, the and I'm you know I'm not getting any um, sales from this myself, no. but it is. I found your writing style incredibly easy to read, and you do put it succinctly, which okay. I I just wanted to say that a second time because when people see very big books, that can put them off. Yeah. Um, and uh, 180 is uh, another book by Fergus Gr Greenwood O'Connor, which yes, I've um, heard of that. is again, I mean, it's one of the first books that I read in this um, whole thing about, you know, what's going on and everything's upside down, 180 degrees, hence um, that it's all the other way around. And again, that was written so so clearly. And it it is worth getting these sort of big encapsulating tomes because 
if you enjoy, you know, if you're a reader and you, you know it's like, you must be a reader. If you enjoy a good book, you don't want it to end. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if the writer can write nicely uh, for a, a lay audience, it makes so much difference. So uh, I, yeah. that's why I always like to say that about authors. If I don't say it, it means the book was hard to get into. Right, right. As some of the technical things. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's, so we've got the falsification of science here. T Titanic's last secret. Yeah. Um, um, before I mention Titanic's last secret, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about RMS Olympic, which is just on the screen now there, uh, next to the uh, one with the Union flag on. Um, uh, RMS Olympic is a real Titanic story. It's, it's what really happened. I spent three years, research that was my second book, and I, I spent three years solid just researching that alone. And, uh, you know, believe me, anybody out there who's not aware, the Titanic story is absolutely not what it's portrayed to be by the mainstream. Mm. It was actually that the, the myths and legends of Titanic, and that's what they are, um, were brought to us courtesy of an ex-CIA agent by the name of um, Walter Lord, who wrote a book in the very early 1950s called The Night to Remember, which was turned into a feature film in the late 1950s um, starring Kenneth Moore and some other female actress, I can't remember her name. Um, they were the two, you know, they were the two male and female lead, and yeah. that is what created the Titanic story, in effect. And it was done for, you know, a very, very good reason. Uh, you know, why didn't they tell the truth about it? Because the truth is very, very sordid indeed. And I go into massive detail about that. And, and I did some extensive research. I went up to I spent some time in Belfast you know, where the ship was built, researching that, speaking to families of the, uh, you know, descendants of the shipbuilders, etc. So, yeah, there's a lot of very, very startling information in there, to say the least. Gosh. And so, and then, so the, the Titanic one, is that a follow-up one? That, no, the Titanic one is, right, okay, I'll just tell you a little story, actually, for time. Yeah, yeah. Briefly. Um, right, okay, I, I when I... Uh, I wrote about the Titanic in falsification of history. So there's a section, a very small section about the Titanic in falsification of history. Uh, there wasn't enough room to put the full story in, so that's why I turned it into a book, partly. But I was actually contacted by a Hollywood film director in about 2013, and she invited me over to California. I spent two weeks with her in a ranch in the Hollywood Hills, which was very, very nice. Thank you. And um, we spent some time going around to see uh, film producers to try and raise funds to make my version of the Titanic story, if you like. Well, the upshot was that nobody was really interested because of the content again. But one guy, one guy said to me, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. He said, but we need a book. So I said, OK, so you want me to write a book then about what really happened? And he said, yes. Um, OK, so I went away, went, came back home. I spent six weeks and I must have been writing 20 hours a day. No, probably not, like 18 hours a day for six weeks. And I wrote the full Titanic story, which is RMS Olympic, the book RMS Olympic. And uh, I sent him the, the transcript, the manuscript, and he said, no, 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 you misunderstood. He said, it's got to be a novel. And I said, well, I've never written a novel and I, I wouldn't know where to begin. He said, well, have a go. So I did. I came back and I did ex exactly the same thing. And I wrote Titanic's Last Secret, which is a novel based on RMS Olympic. Now, I've no intention of ever writing a novel again, but I wrote it for that specific purpose. But yeah. again, when I, when I finished it, it took me ages. I, I sent him the, the transcript and he said, no, he said, I'm not interested anymore, but thank you. So the, the, the worst thing, that the, the best thing that happened from that was that I got two new books. But, you know, the worst thing was you know, I spent an awful lot of time for nothing in, in a sense. So, yeah, Titanic's Last Secret is the novel based on the factual book, RMS Olympic, which is the well, real Titanic story. And, I mean, isn't that um, just in and of itself, the whole media industry? Yes. Is is full of uh, backstabbing, lies, and and all of that. I mean, I worked in children's television for a very short time in the nineties and right. started to see just how it, the, how much of an illusion it really was. Yes. 
Um, and and I couldn't wait to get out of it really because you could just see that they weren't interested in actually real genuine creativity. No. But it was all about money and certain agendas and egos yeah. particularly. Yeah. Um, and and so I'm so I was cl- pleased to 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 witness that firsthand because it was up until then it's like oh I wanted this is the medium I wanted to be in. Yeah. But this this is so much more genuine, although it is harder to you know you're fighting with so many other people you don't know whether they're being paid to to tell a different story um so yeah so you're certainly someone who doesn't mind sitting down at a computer and tapping out millions of words no uh well yeah i mean i've spent you know kind of i've I've been writing since 2009 Uh, i'm in a bit of a hiatus at the moment uh the last one welcome to the masquerade was published uh beginning of last year um, but um, I've not actually embarked on my next project, which <laughs> seems to recede further and further into the distance because I'm so busy. But mm. I'm hoping to write one uh, which has got a working title at the moment of 2034, which uh, is just exactly 50 years after 1984 and examine and trying to examine what I believe the world will be like in 2034 if these people get their own way and what. 1984 told us would happen so it was going to be kind of a uh, not a novel like 1984 but a kind of factual book based on you know the way the world is or the way the world may be if, if uh, things pan out the way that these uh, monsters wanted to and so if I mean we're, we, we are where we are it seems to me that we're at a tipping point now Mm-hmm. Um, people are waking up. There's a lot of people yeah. aware of the great harms and things. Yeah. So, so you've obviously got an image of what the world would be like if they got their way. Mm. If we, if we are making a difference by talking about it and trying to wake people up or yeah. uh, make people aware of things and and doing all we do, what's what do you think would be a future by? 2034 then um, for us doing what we you know the movement that's going now yeah I mean I I actually believe that we will stop them in the tracks okay Um, I know that they are getting desperate basically and uh, you know they are pushing the agenda much further but and the problem for them is that they're pushing the agenda much quicker than they want to because people are waking up People are waking up at a, 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 an alarming rate. Well, not an alarming rate, a pleasing rate. It's an alarming rate for them. For them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so people are waking up very quickly. So they are pushing the agenda, which then has the effect of waking even more people up because people are starting to say, hang on a minute, what on earth is all this stuff that's going on? This can't be right. Mm-hmm. And they look into it and, you know, people like myself and yourself, Richard, you know, we help them to wake up. And it, it's it's happening on a massive scale. I mean, I'll give you an example of what um, of, of of how we've had actually made them change their agenda. In 2012, I think it was 2012 or maybe in 14, there was something published called the Rockefeller Lockstep document, which you may or may not have heard of. But basically, what the Rockefeller Lockstep document was, it was a blueprint for what happened between 2019 and 2022. Now, in the document, it says this will continue, it will begin in 2020 and it will continue till 2025. Well, they had to curtail it, of course, because it ended in 2022. And I believe the reason that they had to curtail it was because people would, they realised it was just waking people up too fast. People were pushing back, people were, were becoming aware of not just the nonsense that was COVID, but all the other stuff associated with it as well. So that was one example. We, we cut them off in their tracks, but now they're trying all sorts of other different avenues. I don't think they'll try the pandemic one again. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, they haven't finished with us yet, don't, don't get me wrong. And they're not going to go down without the fight, but I believe we're definitely on the right road. So mm-hmm. 2034, <clears throat> to answer your question, if they, um, if they, um, <clears throat> they do get their own way, again i'll repeat but i don't think they will then the world will be very different in 10 years because they are hammering ai and transhumanism and what i mean by transhumanism for those are not aware is the merging of man with machine to make human 2.0 and they're well down the track with that because 
we, we already know that there are patents out there on the internet and it's easy to, to find them uh, for the downloading, remote downloading of information into the human brain and the ability to change people's memories and also the physical control of the human body remotely as well. This is also well on its way and I believe uh, that some of the stuff that was in the vaccines I don't know whether you've ever seen the stuff about these kind of micro machines that are that are in there that self-assemble under certain conditions, such as 5G. The, that stuff is there to facilitate this. So that's where we're going if they get their own way. But, you know, I, I don't want people to worry. I, I, I have a very, very positive outlook. I do believe that we will win, and that's not just me being overly optimistic. I genuinely believe it. And do you think that, uh, I mean, we can't carry on with the world corporate um, corporations running everything. Do you think that we will go back to um, a, a similar independent sole trading, family trading, small, local, that sort of thing again? Because think, it seems... I, I think we will, but probably not in our lifetimes, Richard, sadly. Um, right. But hopefully in our children's lifetime or our children's children's lifetimes... Uh, it will eventually happen. I, I believe this. I'm not, uh, you know, obviously I've got no guarantees. I can't guarantee it will happen. But my, in my belief and according to what I, I, I discover when I research, I believe that we will win in the end. Mm. But as to time scales, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, no, interesting stuff. Well, um, we're coming to the, the end of the sort of allotted time that I normally like for uh, interviews, and it's always good to leave people on a positive note, so I appreciate that. However, if you are curious about what is true and what is not true, uh, what is probable, what is not probable, or what the... what the um, the, what do they call it? The uh, in politics they call it the spin. The spin. That's right. What the spin is on those events, then um, go and check out John's um, amazing work. I mean, golly, you <laughs> you must have worn out the fingertips of your hands on all of that. It's a pretty intense decade, shall we say, the twenty teens. Yes. <laughs> So tell me now, just as a matter of interest, here's a, here's a question for you. Um, looking at the ability of things like AI, could you have outlined what you wanted for the book from almost... Give me a chapter on what happened at such and such, the, the moon landings or whatever. And would AI have churned out... I mean, it would have churned out something very quickly. Would it be as anywhere as accurate or honest of as? Not. Of course not. This and then this is the problem. Um, that the, all this fabulous technology that they they foist upon us, and it's in, it's encroaching every aspect of our lives to the point that it absolutely drives myself and my partner Karen absolutely crazy. The whole thing does it's because it's so unreliable. You know, it might be technically reliable. But it's unreliable in the sense that it doesn't actually do what you want it to do when you want it to do it correctly, mm. because it's not it's not um, intelligent. Even though you know the, that's the title, artificial intelligence, it's nothing like as intelligent as a human being. Mm. And you know, it may well be at some point in time if that continues. But um, no, it couldn't. It couldn't possibly do it. it. It's just not at the moment. It's just not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you and I'm, I, I, the thing that you said to, that's very reassuring to me is uh, that you often go back to very old books and you, you look at those. And, and I'm someone who loves books. Um, and what I worry about the AI that's so available that you can just print and it'll go or ask questions and it comes back. You don't get the references. You don't get it doesn't tell you oh, this was from this author who thought this, but he changed his mind later on and thought something different. You know, you don't get that. You just get... And my worry is that kids using this at school or in university or, or even just ordinary everyday adults will take, because it's in black and white on the screen, they print it, it's gospel. And we all know newspapers are in black and white and they ain't gospel either. Not quite. <laughs> and, <we've, laughs> and what's gospel... Is not even necessarily 
gospel. No, <laughs> so, no absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there, there is so much there to um, investigate. John, thank you so much for uh, sparing the time. I uh-huh. uh, wish you well with your talking uh, stuff. Are you in Bath tomorrow? No, um, we're leaving Bath tomorrow. We're going to Western Supermare. I've got to talk there to the... Is it, is it Monday today? Yeah. It is Monday, yeah. Yeah, we're on COVID's track of the days. Yeah, t- tomorrow night we're, I'm talking Western Supermare, yeah. So the details are on my website if anyone wants to attend, if they're near enough to attend. Fantastic. Uh, well, this will go out this, this very day, this afternoon. So... Um, do check out wherever John is talking. Uh, go and get... Now, I understand that if you go to your website, you can get the books a little bit cheaper. Yeah. Um, it, well... Margin. Marginally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can get it a little bit cheaper if you go to the website. But uh, yeah. you know, if you want to publish my email address, Richard, I wouldn't have a problem with that. People can order sign copies directly as well. So, you know, by email. Okay. So, you know, that's, that's fine too. Brilliant. Fantastic, John. I wish you well with all of that. Thank Keep you, up the good work. And um, I'm looking forward to getting through the other yeah. six eighths of the book, or <laughs> however many it is that I've got to get through. Yeah. Um, it's, but it is a brilliant read. Thank you. Um, so there we are, ladies and gentlemen. That is John Hamer. And uh, do check it out, falsificationofhistory.co.uk. I will be back with more monologues and uh, other wonderful guests. But in the meantime, have a wonderful time. Um, I see the chemtrail people are back with their geoengineering, so uh, try and avoid all of that. Stay safe. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.